everyone hits a bump in the road. What do you do with it? Be inspired as we explore the ways people experience, navigate, and manage the ups and downs and twists and turns in this road trip called life. Welcome to another episode of Bump in the Road. The basic podcast is always free. We also have a premium subscription called Bump 2 that lets you listen in on extended behind-the-scenes conversations with our guests. Check it out at www.bumpintheroad.us. Whitney Prude has one heck of a story to tell. It's a story about navigating an autoimmune disease that sent her seemingly perfect life careening off in an unexpected direction. From her position as a pharmacist with the Mayo Clinic to that of bedridden disability, Whitney had the courage to persevere and remake her entire life, and now she's helping others do the same. Please welcome Whitney Prude to Bump in the Road. Whitney, welcome to Bump in the Road. If you would, tell us your story. Oh, thank you. I'm excited to be here, and my story really kind of starts back when I was a teenager. Uh, I was 16 and it was the first time in my life where I realized that things don't turn out exactly (laughs) how you plan for them to. We always think as kids, you know, that we have dreams and we have plans and, you know, that life goes how we want it to. And when I was 16, my parents went through a pretty nasty divorce, in my opinion, you know, as a teenager, it's already a hard time of life. And I, I was very devastated. I, you know, it felt like my entire foundation had just crumbled beneath me. And at that point, you know, my relationships, all of my closest relationships were in shambles. And I, I really didn't know what to do or how to deal with it. Nobody really teaches us these things. Nobody teaches us how to get through hard things in life and how to deal with emotions and how to process those things. And so I did what most human beings do. And I figured out how to survive and I figured out how to keep on moving. And essentially what happens when you do that is that you you bury, you bury your feelings and so I buried the pain, I buried the hurt, and I I kept moving. And I remember one one pivotal moment during that time of my life, and I decided that I wasn't going to allow this experience to destroy my life and, and to essentially use it as an excuse to make poor choices or to be a rebellious teenager and and blame it on my circumstances right so i decided hey you know what i have i have a dream i want to become a pharmacist and i'm going to get there and so i i essentially became hyper focused on becoming a pharmacist and that essentially led me to <laughs> ultimately overachieving, doing literally everything I possibly could do in order to be successful and to get myself where I wanted to go. Now, when I was in pharmacy school, I if you would have asked me at that point like how I was doing um, and with my parents' divorce and all of those things, I would have said I was perfectly fine. Everything was great. Life was good. I was doing really well. And it wasn't until my the end of my first year in pharmacy school that I realized that that wasn't actually the case. Um, There was one day in particular where I really, I mean, I came, I came home from school. I had, I had sat through eight hours of lecture and I had mountains of studying left to do. I was completely exhausted, probably, you know, I was in zombie mode at that point, going through the motions, just trying to survive the load of pharmacy school. And I just, I went into my bedroom and before I could even get to my bed, I just crumbled. I crumbled to the floor and I just, I sobbed and I sobbed and I sobbed and I sobbed. And it was in that moment when I was finally able to pull myself together that I realized that I wasn't okay, that, you know, I had been covering up a lot of stuff. And what pharmacy school did for me 
was it caused me, it pushed me to my breaking point. It pushed me past my ability to cover up all the problems underneath the surface. And so because it pushed me so hard, I no longer had the capacity to be able to cover those things up. And I, you know, I really started to struggle and I was having, you know, emotional meltdown. It was incredibly challenging to keep going. So I finally said, you know what, hey, I'm not okay. And I got to get some help. I don't know, you know, I don't know why I'm having these meltdowns all the time. What's going on? So I, you know, I went to therapy, I started working through everything. And of course, it comes down to, you know, my parents divorced, um, broken relationships, feeling abandoned, abandoning myself, codependency, all of those things, you know, they just add up and you just bury them and you just learn how to survive. And so I started working through a lot of those things. I spent several years. Um, but I, uh, you know, I mean, I made it through pharmacy school and I got to my first job and I felt like, hey, you know what? Like, I've made it. I've worked through all of this stuff. I'm feeling pretty good. And I have my dream job. Like, what more could I want? Right. I can start living my life. I can start dating. I can, you know, the sky's the limit at this point. And about nine months into that job, I ended up getting a pain in my wrists that essentially crippled me from being able to use the computer. And that was my job. I mean, I was a pharmacist and I was on the computer all the time. And um, so I was like, oh, well, I'll just, you know, I'll let my wrists rest for a couple of weeks. Everything will be back to normal. And in about two months from that time, I was severely fatigued and sick. I was in a lot of pain. I was nearly bedridden. And I found myself in a rheumatologist's office. And my life completely turned upside down at that point. I was active. I was always, you know, I was outdoors. I was, I always played sports, would go dancing, um, would travel the world. I, you know, very adventurous. Um, and all of that stuff was gone. I had to give up all of my hobbies. Um, I couldn't hardly walk. I was in a scooter. I'd ride a scooter at work. I could barely get through my shift. I was afraid I was going to lose my job. And so at 28, I was nearly bedridden. I had $200,000 of student debt hanging over my head. And I say, crap, what do what I do, do you now? Do? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do I do now? And so... I remember laying in my bed. That's almost, that's almost all I could do is just lay in my bed. I spent hours, <laughs> weeks, months just laying in my bed. And it was interesting because, uh, you know, I started thinking, okay, like if I can't do this, I've got to be able to find something else that I can do. I've got to be able to pay off this loan. And so I started, you know, kind of looking into doing my own business, public speaking, kind of got into coaching and, I really, I started looking, I had remembered, I was like, I think there's some celebrities that, that have chronic illness. And I'm just like, how do they do it? You know, I was like, I want to hear some people's stories. And that's when I came across Lady Gaga, who had, you know, have has a lot of like chronic conditions and pain and that sort of thing. And so I started just kind of searching for videos and searching for her story and there was one there was one video where she was really talking. She kind of came out about her um, illness and she had said, my pain really does me no good unless I can transform it into something that is. And I held on to that and I took that and I ran with it and I said, hey, you know what? I'm going to take my pain. I'm going to take my struggles that I've been through over the last 30 or 15 years and I'm going to transform it um, into something that can be powerful, something that can help people to avoid the pitfalls that I have been through and help them to transform their lives. And so months and years on the couch and in bed, I started to create a program, a, a whole health transformation program 
that takes people through this transformation process, you know, that took me seven years. Um, and, uh, and that's, you know, that kind of brings me to where I'm at today, dealing still with a lot of my limitations with an autoimmune disease, but gosh, it hasn't been easy. Now, autoimmune diseases are brutal and they're so hard because doctors often can't find the root cause. So they don't know how to treat it. And then you have to look at the pharmaceutical versus the more holistic type of treatment. But I think one of the hardest things is the fatigue. How do you manage fatigue while you still strive for really significant goals? Luckily, so I, I mean, I did go through and this was, it was incredibly challenging going to the doctor and trying to convince them that I had what I had. And, you know, with the pharmacist knowledge saying, you know, it was like, this isn't, I'm not making this up. I don't need yeah. to go to a psychologist. I don't need to, you know, um, it's not in my head, you know, give me a medication to treat the what's going on. But it took a long time for like the labs to really develop to kind of show more of, of what I had. And still, there's still confusion. Nobody really gives me just a blanket like diagnosis of like, this is what you have. And so it was a really, there was a really challenging time period where um, I was showing up and trying to convince doctors that I actually had what I had and that my quality of life was as miserable as it was. And I did not realize throughout the entire journey, that was the hardest part, sitting there sobbing in doctor's appointments, trying to convince them that I was actually as sick as I was. Um, I it was part, devastating. Yeah, no, part of it too is you look fine. Physically, you look fine. Nobody can understand how you feel or what you're going through. And I think it's just terrible that the first response, frankly, from the medical profession is you need to see a psychiatrist or psychologist. Uh, it's just, <laughs> where does this come from? Yeah, no, it's, it's tough. And I mean, I, I understand to some degree, I mean, there, you know, doctors see any number of patients and um, maybe sometimes that is the case, but man, that was tough. It was, it was really challenging. Um, I, I did finally end up getting a medication. It took, it took about a year for that medication to really start taking effect and for me to really start feeling a difference. Um, so, you know, it was just, <laughs> I mean, I spent a lot of time in bed. I really did and um, had a lot of limitations. I still do. And you're right. Like what you said when, you know, when you say it's, it's invisible, it is, it's an invisible disability and nobody really knows until they see me riding in a, a you know, an electric scooter or see me, you know, pushed in a wheelchair or, uh, and thankfully, you know, um, we have, you know, at the airport, for example, I always, you know, I always get a wheelchair and thankfully, you know, nobody asks questions and nobody looks at you like, really, like you're young, you're thin, you're, you know, like walk through security and get yourself to your gate, right? Um, thankfully, you know, in those situations, nobody ever gives you any pushback. It's just, you need a wheelchair, here's a wheelchair. Um, but uh, that doesn't, you know, it doesn't make it easy. Um, but that's the only way, that's the only thing that really takes, you know, the illness from being invisible to being visible. Um, what happened with your circle of friends? You know, I, I mean, pretty much everything went away. I couldn't do anything, you know. Um, and so the challenging part is that I had just moved to a new place. And so I luckily, I had already met um, my my now husband, but I was already dating him. And so he knew me before I was sick. And so thankfully, he kind he kind of stuck with me through it. But that was really, really challenging. I mean, now <laughs> when we try to talk about like, is it possible for us to try and have children or, you know, anything like that? Like, can my body handle it? Do you know, it's like, is this even possible? He doesn't even want to go there because, you know, he has like almost like PTSD from like trying to get me through like being really sick. So him thinking of like, if this made me really sick, 
it's just like, you know, he's like, that's not an option. Like we're not going there again. Um, but thankfully I had his support. Otherwise, like I didn't have the ability to make friends. I didn't have the ability to go out and, and meet people and show up and, and put effort and energy in. I, I didn't have anything. I literally had no energy. Some days I could barely get in the shower. Um, and that's all I could handle in a day. Otherwise I was just in bed. So, I mean, friends were non-existent. It just wasn't, you know, I couldn't, I didn't have the ability to create the life that I normally would have. And so it, I mean, I was alone. I was across the country from my family. It was me and me and my struggling boyfriend at the time. And that's, that's what I had. What pushed you forward through this to create a new life? I have no freaking clue. Seriously, I don't, I don't know. I mean, when I, when I think about it and where, you know, where my drive comes from, I, I look back to um, significant women in my life. I look at my mom. Um, I look at my grandmother who, you know, my, my grandmother lost her mom at seven years old. And when she tells her story, you know, at seven years old, she lost her mom very likely to lupus. And, um, she started taking care of the farm. She started, you know, her dad was an alcoholic. And so she, she took care of the home. She got her brothers up, got them ready for school, got them on the bus. And she, every single morning she was out taking care of, you know, taking care of the cattle and, um, milking the cows and, you know, and, um, I just think about that and I'm like, what, you know, what, what seven year old does that? Um, and so when, you know, when I've been asked this question before, like, where does it come from? Like, why, you know, why don't you just, why don't you give up? Why don't you just say, oh, I'm on disability the rest of my life or, you, can't you know, give up. you're too, you're too intelligent. To yeah. give up. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, you know, I think, and, and my mom similarly too, has an incredible story of, you know, going through a divorce after being a single mom for 20 years. And she started from ground zero, worked her way through pharmacy school, and is now going to be able to retire at 65. Um, I mean, it's just, it's incredible. And so I just kind of, you know, I look back at, at those women in my life and I say, genetically, I think I was given a gift uh, I truly do. Um, that 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 drive comes from somewhere inside of me. That there isn't another option. There's only one option, and that option is is that you move forward. That you, you know, life's going to give you lemons, and uh, you have a choice. You can either choose to let life destroy you. And to regret that when you get to, you know, your last day and you're like, man, you know, what did I do with my life? Or you can make it the best that it can be with your circumstances. You change the things that are in your control and you accept the things that you can't control and you learn how to have a fulfilling, joyful life. And I guess in my head, there's no other option. You fight for that every day. What are some of the key elements that came out of this experience that became part of your teaching and course? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, what's interesting is the most devastating thing for me was actually my parents' divorce. Now, when you think about an autoimmune disease that takes away every aspect of your life, that wasn't as devastating for me as my parents' divorce. But the reason... Uh, the reason is ultimately because through my parents' divorce and in pharmacy school and when I kind of crumbled, I was very, very unhealthy and mentally and emotionally, right? And there was, there was a void inside of myself um, that, you know, I didn't know how to show up for myself. I didn't, you know, I didn't have all of those things in place where I really could be there for me and, um and help myself through. And, you know, I was seeking, I needed other people to show up for me, to show me that I was loved and that I was worthy and I was good enough. And once I got, once I, you know, I spent what, seven years or more working through all of those things and getting really strong inside of myself. And so when the autoimmune disease came, yes, it was hard, and I had to grieve the loss of my life and figure out, you know, how do we make this work? But it wasn't nearly as devastating 
as going through, you know, my parents' divorce. And it's because of where I had gotten myself to, where I had worked mentally and emotionally to get my internal self to. And so that was, that was the biggest thing of, you know, learning, learning about me, learning about how I can show up for myself. I don't need, I don't need anyone um, to tell me that I'm loved because I know, I know that I'm good enough, right? I know who I am and I, and I genuinely care about myself, right? And so having that, um, having that genuine belief inside of myself, um, I think that that drove me to be able to say, Hey, you know what, like this is the, you know, I can't do anything about this. Um, and so we just, we go to the next step, which is how do you still live? How do you still, you know, how do you still make life worth living essentially? And that's, I mean, every day, that's what I'm working for. How do, how do I make my life worth living for me I and think- for my husband? Yeah, I think the better you get to know yourself, the greater your reservoir of emotional resilience. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I mean, that's what I, that's what I help people with every day. So what, you know, what did I get out of this entire experience, everything that I've gone through? Well, uh, you know, I got all of the, the life wisdom, I guess, all of the knowledge, um, all of like learning about myself, how to go through this transformational journey of finding myself. Um, and I put it all together into a program so that I can help change other people's lives, um, and help them avoid a lot of the pitfalls that I, I went through, you know, I mean, that's, I I don't know. I, I don't know that I could really write on paper everything that, that I've gained through all of this. What are some of the common pitfalls that many of us fall into? Oh boy. (laughs) (laughs) The, the biggest, um, the biggest pitfall that I see, and I did not intend for this, um, when I wrote, when I, you know, when I put together my program, the biggest pitfall is that people don't genuinely love and care for themselves. Um, and, and typically this comes from, I mean, I did, I did the exact same thing is that, you know, my, my world fell apart, my world crumbled and I went through trauma and, uh, with my parents' divorce and, um, you, you try to find ways to feel loved and feel good enough and feel, uh, meet expectations. And, you know, as you're, you're trying your, our, our brains, you know, are designed to figure out how to survive and to figure out how to get our needs, our needs met. And the biggest pitfall that I see is that because we develop coping mechanisms and we try to figure out how to fill the void within ourselves, we end up very unhealthy, whether that's with an autoimmune disease, whether that's, you know, gaining a bunch of weight, ending up with diabetes or high cholesterol, blood pressure, whatever, right? Whatever we end up with, your mental and emotional stress is going to manifest itself physically at some point or another. It might not be right after the fact, but even if you look at people who have been like sexually assaulted or abused, Mm -hmm they can cover that up for a really long time, but it will manifest. And a lot of times it manifests in weight gain. They're protecting themselves. That weight isn't, you know, the weight isn't the problem. The weight is actually what's keeping them safe and unnoticed and people aren't looking at them and checking them out. And um, so, so the, the weight is their solution, but people don't, realize that they don't realize subconsciously what they're doing to their body and to their health. Um, and so that's, that's the biggest thing we try, we try to subconsciously, our brains will always find a way to cope. We'll always try to find a way to survive. Um, and those things will manifest in our physical health if we don't, you know, if we don't address them and work through them properly, but that's the biggest pitfall is that we don't, as, as a population, just in general, as a human (laughs) population, we don't know that stuff. We don't realize that stuff. Right. No one, and no so, one talks to us about it. No one gives no. us a roadmap for this. And it's so frustrating because we, it, to some extent, we're all recreating the wheel. Yep. 100%. You know, and, and I think all the time it's like 
when people, when people ask me about, you know, it's like, what's the mental and emotional stuff in your program? I'm like, it's, it's the stuff that you should have been taught, you know, all through school, just like you had nutrition classes and just like you had PE, you know, it was like, we should have been taught this stuff. Um, and so it's, you know, it's education that we all need and we've all needed it since we were kids. Speaking of nutrition, that's another piece of the equation, I think. And we are nutritionally illiterate, generally speaking, as a society. We chase whatever the latest drug or fad is. Um, I mean, go walk into a supermarket. The fact that the majority of their sales come from that interior section where it's just processed food. I think Mm -hmm. of it all as fake food. It's a little terrifying. Yeah. I mean, yeah. in, in, I'm living in Prescott, Arizona right now, wonderful town, but dining out, the options are essentially pub food. I don't eat pub food. <laughs> There's nothing healthy. <laughs> it really becomes a challenge to find something healthy. And I think the more educated you get, the more, the more, more of a challenge it is, frankly. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's absolutely true. And I just, you know, there's just a huge, like you said, just a huge lack of, of knowledge of like, what, what should I actually be doing? What should I be eating? Um, but I, I always, you know, I always say that it goes much deeper than that, right? Like what is, what's driving our behavior to eat the way that we're doing? Yes, there's a lack of knowledge, but what about, what about all of the emotional baggage that we carry around on a daily basis and food makes us feel good? And so food is a very easy way to self-soothe, you know, and it's not, it's not looked at like a drug or, um, you know, something that we can get addicted to. And so um, it becomes, you know, the easiest way to put a bandaid on what we really need that, you know, it's like eat a half gallon of ice cream, you know, (laughs) and watch your favorite TV show and that'll get you through, you know, a hard night. Um, it's all distraction. Oh, yeah. Yep. Do you do any sort of meditation with your clients? So I do teach. Uh, I teach the basics of meditation in my program. And I'm not, so I'm not the, I don't take the approach of like, hey, you need to meditate on a regular basis. But the reason that I have people try meditation and do meditation is because usually we're not aware of all of the crap that's going on and buzzing around in our heads. And if we can start to notice that and start to calm a lot of what's, you know, running around in our minds, um, it can be really, really powerful. So I, so I do, I teach people meditation and there are certain people that I work with where it's like, this is going to be really beneficial for you, but I don't teach it in a way of like, this needs to become, you know, your, your everyday habit. Some people, you know, some people will, will do that, but, um, it's more, it's more a skill and, a um, a step in the journey of starting to learn more about yourself and being aware of what's actually going on in your head and learning how to be aware of those things and and calm a lot of those thoughts. Is your practice regional or do you um, connect with people online? So everything that I do is virtual. So I, Mm -hmm. I, all of my clients, they're, they're all over the country. And I also have a client in Australia. Um, And so that's, I mean, that's, that's a pretty cool part of my business is that, you know, I'm (laughs) time zones are a nightmare, but yeah, all (laughs) across the country, everybody, you know, from different States and um, yeah, one from Australia, that's, you know, it's been, it's been fun to have a, have a client from Australia. Um, I don't usually reach out to other countries just because currency is so different, um, and so it makes it challenging for people to like afford the program, but, um, yeah, it's very, very widespread. <laughs> when somebody hits a point in their life where things fall apart, what two or three things would you tell them to do? Don't give up. Number one. Right. I think that uh, that goes, says it, I mean it speaks for itself, right? Um, but I guess I I guess I would give people the guidance of remembering that you always have a choice, 
every single day that you wake up, you get to choose. What am I going to do with my day? What am I going to do with my life? Where do I want to, where do I want to get myself? And you get to choose, am I going to stay in the slumps and, and let my life pass me by? Or am I going to get up? Am I going to find a way to make something of whatever the situation is? Thank you for listening. I hope you'll support this podcast by becoming a Bump2 subscriber. Buy us a cup of coffee. It's your support that makes this podcast and website possible. I hope you found something in today's podcast that inspires you along your own life's path, because sometimes a bump in the road is actually a portal into a more conscious and meaningful life.